Two weeks ago, the Business Roundtable, which consists of the chief executives of uh, most of America's largest companies, issues a statement of um, essentially the objectives and role of American corporations. And they withdrew in the course of it the statement which they had made 40 years ago, which essentially asserted the doctrine of shareholder rights in favor of a statement which acknowledged that corporations in the United States had to recognize that they owed obligations to a wide range of shareholders. I think that's a very significant event and it's a response to essentially a great deal of well-founded and justified criticism about uh, the legitimacy of modern business and its behavior. It's actually 49 years since September 1970 when Milton Friedman published what is probably the most widely read article that the New York Times has ever printed, certainly my, my, not widely read, but widely quoted article, entitled The Social Responsibility of Business is to Maximize Its Profits. And I'd like to suggest an ambition for everyone in this room, that when this conference meets again in September 2020, precisely 50 years after that statement, we can draw a line after that particular episode in business history. I'm going to take a moment to remind you of what is actually in that particular article. And it begins by saying that the suggestion that uh, companies have a responsibility other than to maximize their profits is to quote, pure unadulterated socialism. Well, I'm not very clear what pure, unadulterated socialism is. And it clearly meant something different to Marx or to Lenin or to Xi Jinping or even to Bernie Sanders. But you can get an idea of the tone of the article from that statement. And it goes on to assert two key propositions. This is what Friedman said. A corporate executive is an employee of the owners of the business. He has direct responsibility to his employers. That responsibility is to conduct the business in accordance with their desires, which generally will be to make as much money as possible, while conforming to the basic rules of that society. But one or two things you should notice about that statement right away. The first is that it's not a statement about economics. Indeed, although Friedman is an economist, there is actually no economic argument in that particular, uh, in that particular piece. There is no relationship, for example, to the finance theory, which we've already been discussing. It's a moral stroke legal argument. It's not clear what Friedman believes the status of these propositions are, but that's what he said. The second is that there are two key propositions in that. The first is the statement uh, that the, the corporate executive is an employee of the owners of the business. That statement is flatly wrong. The corporate executive is an employee of the corporation. And that's not a technical point. It's a very fundamental point. Because the whole concept of a corporation, which has existed till Roman times. The word actually comes from the Latin corporatio. The whole concept of a corporation is to create an institution which has assets and our liabilities on the one hand and makes contracts on the other. And these assets and liabilities are not the assets and liabilities of any particular people and the contracts do not confer rights or obligations on any particular people. That's what's meant by a corporation, and that's what's enshrined in corporate law and practice everywhere in the world. So the corporate executive is a not an employee 
of the owners of the business or the shareholders. The second, more implied suggestion is that the shareholders of the company are the owners of the business. That is, the company is owned by its shareholders. That's a more complicated proposition and one needs to do a bit of unpicking of it. Um, as I've said, the assets, the company holds assets and liabilities which are not the assets and liabilities of any particular individuals. The statement that shareholders own a company is one that you will hear very widely discussed everywhere around the world. But is it true? As far as Britain is concerned, as a legal matter, the House of Lords determined in 1948 that shareholders are not, the Lord said, in the eyes of the law, part owners of the company. They suggested that that followed from this basic concept of the corporation, which is that the assets and liabilities of the corporation were the assets and liabilities of the corporation and not the assets or liabilities of any particular people. But nevertheless, if you read that legal judgment and other legal judgments, in 2004, the House of Lords in Britain repeated the same statement, shareholders are uh, in the eyes of the law, not owners of the corporation. But they then rather equivocated as to what the corporation actually was and who owned it. And that's a real difficulty. The truth is that what means by, one means by ownership is not a really a well-defined concept, either as a matter of law or as a matter of economics. The best description I've been able to find of what is meant by ownership is in the legal literature and it is the idea that ownership is essentially a bundle of rights and obligations. And it's a bundle. There is a classic article formulating that 50 years ago by, interestingly, an Oxford legal philosopher, Tony Honoré, and he provides what he describes as 11 badges of ownership. He starts by saying, there is indeed a substantial similarity in the position of one who owns an umbrella in England, France, Russia, China, and any other modern country one may care to mention. Everywhere the owner can, in the simple, uncomplicated case, and an umbrella is a simple, uncomplicated case, in which no other person has an interest in the thing, use it, stop others using it, lend it, sell it, or leave it by will. Nowhere may he use it to poke his neighbor in the ribs or knock over his vase. And Honoré goes on to list, uh, elaborating that, essentially 11 tests of ownership. Firstly, there's the right to possess. That is, my umbrella is in my house. Secondly, there's the right to use it. I can take my umbrella with me whenever it rains. Thirdly, I have the right to manage my umbrella. I can decide who has it, who I, who I lends it to, and indeed, uh, how they use it. I have a right to the income from the umbrella. I can rent it out if I want and keep the proceeds. I have a right to the capital. I, have, uh, I can sell it. I have the right of security, however, unless I sell it, I enjoy these rights so long as I hold it. I have what he calls the incident of transmissibility. I can leave my umbrella to my family. There's absence of term, the, the rights to my umbrella don't run out. There's the prohibition of far ho harmful use. I'm liable for the harmful use of my umbrella. There's the liability for execution. The umbrella can be used, to seize, uh, can be seized to pay my debts. And there's what he calls residuary character any rights over my umbrella that are not explicitly prescribed to, to somebody else, I hold. How many of these tests apply to the relationship between shareholders and a corporation? One could go back to the beginning and talk about the right to possession, 
I hold shares in a number of companies. If I turn up at the head office of these companies, I will not be let in. Do I have the right to use it? Hard to argue that. I have shares in Vodafone. Unfortunately, they don't give me free uh, mobile telephony as a result. The right to manage, tricky, some rights to manage. Right to the income, tricky, some rights to the income. What I really have is the right to the amount of the income which the directors of the company decide to let me have. Right to the capital, I can sell it. Well, I can sell my shares. If we get together collectively, we may be able to sell the company. Something there, right of security, possibly. Whatever these rights are, I go on having them. Transmissibility, absence of term. Prohibition of harmful use, plainly not. If the corporation you own shares in it does something nasty, it's, uh, you are not liable for that. The assets of the corporation cannot be used to seize your debts. In fact, that's what the majority of cases about uh, the ownership of corporation have been. Either the government or some public agency or some angry spouse wishes to get hold of the assets of a corporate entity and they get pretty short shrift in that from the law. And then there's residuary character. That's a tricky and complicated one, and it's one that has been picked up in the last 30 years in the economics literature on the subject as to what is meant by ownership following what is now generally called the Grossman, Hart, Moore tradition about, uh, about ownership. Uh, but it's actually a tricky one, and actually if one says, I hold any rights not explicitly conferred by somebody else, then pretty clearly it would be the executives of the corporation rather than the shareholders who actually enjoy, own these rights. In fact, if you go back over this list and ask if someone arrived from Mars equipped with these tests and asked to conclude who owned a corporation, he would conclude that uh, um, uh, if anyone owned a corporation, it was the managers, the executives of the corporation. But I think the better conclusion is to say that in talking about corporations and corporate entity, concepts of ownership are just not helpful. A corporation is not owned by anybody any more than the University of Oxford is not owned by anybody. It might be rather better run if it was, but that's an argument which I don't propose to have today. These examination schools we're sitting in are owned by the University of Oxford, but nobody owns the University of Oxford. The University of Oxford is in this sense a corporate entity established by, by Royal Charter and nobody owns it. And the same is true typically of corporations. But if nobody owns corporations and these Friedman arguments about obligations to the owners of a company do not follow from that fact of ownership, are there obligations on a corporation to maximize shareholder value as Friedman asserts? Well, obviously that's a legal question. And the answer to that question, the legal question, depends on the jurisdiction in which we're operating. And the answer I will get depends quite a lot on what jurisdiction I go to. If I go to Germany, uh, I get an answer which is actually rather clear. Germany, as many of you will know, is a civil law country which means that uh, uh, its law is determined by the German Commercial Code. And if I look to see what the German Commercial Code says about the duties of directors, it is the following. The management board assumes full responsibility for managing the company in the best interests of the company, meaning that it considers the needs of the shareholders the employees and other stakeholders with the objective 
of sustainable value creation. That, I think, is pretty clear. If I come to Britain, the position is less clear. As most of you will know, the position in Britain is covered by Section 172 of the Companies Act, which says the duty of directors is to promote the success of a company for the benefit of the members, the shareholders, and it goes on to say, having regard to the interests of a variety of shareholders. So there's an ambiguity and a compromise in that formulation, which is missing from the German formulation. And it's an ambiguity in the compromise, which is entirely deliberate. This is the 2006 Companies Act. It was effectively a compromise between competing groups, some of whom wanted to emphasize shareholder obligations and some of whom did not. And the outcome of that was that particular formulation, which appears to give a particular role to shareholders, but emphatically does not say uh, that the shareholder interest takes priority. The key phrase, and it's no accident in that formulation, is that the duty of directors is to promote the success of the company. This goes back to the formulation of a corporate entity. The duty is to the company. It is not to the shareholders. And what happens then if I take the largest jurisdiction for these purposes, which is, of course, the United States? Well, of course, if we're talking about the United States, it's not actually the United States because corporate registration and law in the United States is not a federal matter, it's a state matter. And when we're talking about corporate law, we're talking about law, primarily about law in the state of Delaware. If you doubt that, this is uh, 1092 North Orchard Road, Wilmington, Delaware. This is the headquarters of 300,000 American corporations. It's that quarter, if you, if you thought the headquarters of uh, Google were in Mountain View, if you thought Amazon was headquarters in Cupertino, if you thought Walmart was uh, headquartered in Bentonville, Arizona, as many of you may have thought until now, you're wrong. This is the headquarters of Apple, Google, and Walmart. Orchard Road, Wilmington, Delaware. Can't see very much activity on the part of Amazon, Google, or, um, uh, or Walmart. Indeed, if you went there and asked to meet a representative of Walmart, Google, or, Arizona, or, uh, or Apple, I doubt if you would actually find anyone there. But corporate law in the US is headed in it is basically a matter for the, the, the state of Delaware. Now, Lynn Stout, to whom we're indebted for a great deal of work on these issues in the United States, who sadly died last year, argued that US law was actually less shareholder friendly than UK law. And she went on to argue that that uh, actually demonstrated the superiority of US law in this particular connection. I think Lynn had rather missed the point here, which is that the difference between US law and Delaware, Delaware law and UK law, is not that UK law is more shareholder friendly, it is that US law is more management friendly. And that's not an accident, that follows from the fact that law in the United States, corporate law, is a state matter, and states have in effect competed to attract corporate registrations. Who determines where corporations are registered and the law that primarily governs their activities? The answer is it is the management of the company concerned. And that's why uh, the law in the United States basically allows corporations to have various provisions like denial of proxy access, staggered boards, and poison pills which are not allowed to companies in other countries, including particularly Britain. US law is not so much shareholder friendly as management friendly. 
And what has happened over the last 50 years is that this rhetoric of shareholder value has essentially been allowed to provide a cover for the growth of the power and role of management in the operation of a corporation relative to all other stakeholders in the company. I talk to a lot of people who, uh, who think that um, what happened in the financial system up to 2008 was that companies were pursuing shareholder interest aggressively at the expense of all others. The truth is quite different. The truth is that what happened in the financial system up to 2008 is that many, indeed most, large financial institutions were pursuing the interests of their senior employees at the expense of all other shareholder stakeholders, including their shareholders. No one should think that bank shareholders did well out of the excesses which led to the financial crisis of 2008. So this story, this Friedman story about the obligation of companies to pursue shareholder value does not follow either from the quasi-moral arguments that, shareholder, that Friedman presents or from uh, the existence of corporate law. And to emphasize again, corporate law varies according to the jurisdiction in which you're operating. Corporate law in most jurisdictions, including primarily, including particularly Delaware, emphasizes a business judgment rule. That is that the courts will not challenge any honestly made decision by the managers of the company. And rather bizarrely, for the shareholders own the company view, it is that when shareholders sue because they feel they've been wronged, as they increasingly do, they don't, show so, they don't sue managers, they sue the company, because that is actually the only organization which owes them any particular duties. If we're to frame this argument for the 21st century, we need, I think, to review not only the legal and moral structure underpinning this, but actually the changes which have occurred in the nature of the firm. If I go back more than 200 years with Adam Smith writing about the pin factory in which uh, 10 people engaged in division of labor in order to manufacture pins. I discovered recently, rather interesting, that despite what he says, Adam Smith never actually visited a pin factory. He copied a description of a pin factory out of a French encyclopedia he happened to have read a few years earlier. But pass that by for the moment. The pin factory was characterized by a linear process. Uh, that is, one person did one task, then it passed the pin on to another, performed another task. That's exactly Adam Smith's description of it. And this was repetitive as well. Every pin was the same as every other pin, and every pin went through that kind of process. And the logic of that in the, extensive, in the highly capital intensive world of the manufacturing companies that developed in the 19th century and came to dominate the corporate economy in the 20th century was one characterized by capital intensive plants where the plant was specialized to its particular use in which people undertook these linear process, these linear and repetitive processes. And that reached its epitome in the early 20th century with tailorism in which you routinize these processes, with a principal agent framework in which you incentivize people to produce as many pins or Model T Fords or whatever it might be as possible, uh, and in which you, it was reasonable to say that the shareholders in some sense owned the plant to which they had contributed the capital, even if that wasn't technically true as a matter of, as a matter of law. And if you read about the corporation in the 20th century, it's almost funny the extent to which people writing about corporations 
are writing about one firm. When Alfred Chandler founded Business History, the company he was principally writing about was General Motors. When Ronald Coase founded the economic theory of the firm in, 1930s, in the 1930s, what he was writing about was a thinly disguised description of a visit to General Motors. When Peter Drucker wrote the first business selling, best selling business book in 1946, it was a book with the title I've taken today, The Concept of the Corporation, a book about General Motors. And when Ralph Nader started to attack corporatism in America in the 1960s, what was the company he chose to focus on? It was, of course, General Motors. If you were to read the academic literature on business uh, in the 20th century, insofar it was about any particular individual firm at all, it was about General Motors. And yet the people who wrote that didn't seem to have noticed that by the 1980s, General Motors had not only ceased to be the epitome of effective modern organization, it had actually ceased even to be very good at being General Motors. General Motors was being overtaken by companies, in the first instance, Japanese companies, which empowered their workers, which had different kinds of relationships with their suppliers, and which benefited from higher model quality and shorter model cycles as a result of doing these things. And this new kind of corporation was developed further with the new corporations that dominate the corporate economy today. We're talking now about the kind of companies I described as being headquartered here. We're talking about Apple, we're talking about Amazon, we're talking about Google. We're talking about companies that aren't capital intensive. We're talking about companies that don't need, the, the, that such capital as they do hold is fungible. It's offices, it's machinery. It doesn't need to be owned by the company that operates it, and it typically isn't. A firm today is not a collection of assets that is owned by somebody. A firm is a collection of capabilities and it's quite hard to say it's the kind of perspective on the firm that has been developed more recently by people like Edith Penrose 50 years ago, as a matter of fact, David Teese and the like, that a firm is essentially a collection of, of capabilities, of accumulated collective knowledge that is not owned by any individual or not really owned by the corporation as a whole. And that's the characterization of these companies like Apple and Amazon and Google and Microsoft. And that's how we need to think about companies. We need to stop thinking using that word capitalism because the word capitalism gives an importance to capital in relation to business that has ceased to have over the last 20 or 30 years. That's a 19th century view that continued to describe some businesses into the 20th century, but no longer describes many of these businesses well. I think the best way to describe a modern corporation, one could start with the observation of Charles Handy. In the knowledge economy, a good business is a community with a purpose, not a piece of property. And if one wants a rather fuller and more wordy exposition of that. But I think what is still the best description of the modern corporation, which I know, one can find it from Blair, Margaret Blair and Lynn Stout. It's quite interesting as I end this talk to observe that very few women have actually done work in the areas I've been describing. And yet I'm quoting women almost entirely in these last parts of what I have to say. A public corporation, say Blair and Stout, is a team of people who enter in a complex agreement to work together for their mutual gain. Participants yield control over outputs and key inputs. They enter into this mutual agreement in an effort to reduce wasteful shirking and rent seeking by relegating to an internal hierarchy the right to determine the division of duties and resources in the joint enterprise. They thus agree not to specific terms or outcomes, 
as in a traditional contract, but to a participation in a process of internal goal setting and dispute resolution. A modern corporation then is fundamentally a social institution and it's nothing if it's not a social institution. It's a collection of capabilities and unless we, that's something that law, both law and economics today struggle with because they, for different reasons, demand a certain kind of formalization, which this particular description does not readily lend itself to. But this is the way we should think of be, we be thinking about corporations. We should understand that corporations are social entities with social roles. And unless we think about a corporation in that way, and not the ways that have dominated our thinking and particularly academic research, for the last half century, we shall not understand what is really going on in the modern business world. Thank you all. Hello, my name is Moritz Gilmeyer from the London School of Economics. I'd like to go back to the Milton Friedman quote, and I would like to know what is your understanding of the last part of the Milton Friedman quote you started this presentation with. Yep, so, so the key element you're pointing to in that is both those embodied in law and those embedded by an ethical custom. So what Friedman clearly intends to say is there are some unspecified obligations of public decency which go beyond what is actually required by law and what is required by, uh, and what is required by regulation. There is, of course, no specificity as to what these are or they are how, how they are to be deduced. But there is undoubtedly a loophole in that uh, that would enable people to conclude what the relevant ethical customs are. It's pretty clear that people have not felt very much bound by that. Indeed, one might cite the, the quite extensive debate, particularly in the UK, over egregious tax avoidance by large multinational companies, which were even some of the best companies have asserted plainly falsely that they have a fiduciary duty to avoid tax, but they've gone on to assert that it's entirely legitimate for them to avoid tax and have rejected the argument that popular opinion finds it offensive that people should engage in these highly artificial schemes in order to do so. Um, I don't know what Friedman would have thought about that particular thing. I think he would have taken the same position probably as the, the corporate executive. There's also an interesting angle which occurs to me in relation to what I've said earlier about corporate law depending on its jurisdiction. It means, of course, that the obligations of directors relate not just to the legal duties imposed by Britain and the United States, but also the jurisdictions of Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Antilles, the Cayman Islands, since the vast majority of large companies today have subsidiaries in every single one of these particular entities. And I confess, I don't know what the law of the Netherlands, the corporate law of the Netherlands, Antilles are, and I'm willing to bet there are precious few corporate executives who do. I mean, my experience is that until a couple of years ago, the vast majority of company directors you wanted, you, one talked to, would not know what shareholders, what, what section 172 was, if you mentioned it to them. That is, people would talk about the law without any knowledge of what the law is. I think the debate which you and others have promoted in the last two or three years has meant there are rather more people who at least know what section 172 says. Uh, but I was interested that, you know, I think Paul Collier's excellent book published last year, many of you will have read. Uh, Paul wrote in the earlier draft of that, in, in the dra early draft of that which I read, that uh, in Britain it's the duty of companies to maximize shareholder value. I said to him, Paul, I think, I don't think you'll find that r that is right. So in the final version, he modified it to, uh, that's not right, but actually several company directors I talked to told me that even if it wasn't right, they behaved as if it was. 
And I think that is, that is in fact the case, that people will say again and again, of course there is a duty to maximise shareholder value without any knowledge of what the underlying legal position actually is. Given your concept of what a corporation in the century should look like, how should a corporation, a corporation then um, incorporate sustainability? To the Blair and Stout statement at the end, ambiguity is inherent in that. And the resolution of the ambiguity is in the first instance something for the board of, for, for the board of directors and the corporate executives. What this is saying, I think correctly, is that the, na the nature of a corporation is that all the stakeholders, shareholders, other investors, suppliers, employees particularly, and the community as a whole, entrust the balancing of these interests and the fair distribution of the proceeds of these interests in the first instance to a, a board of directors and the corporate executives they hire. Secondarily, there's a question of how they are accountable ultimately for the exercise of that particular discretion. I think that's a fundamental question and one which we need to debate. I think one of the things one learns from this kind of argument is that whenever one thinks about the arguments about shareholder primacy, it may actually not be a bad result to have properly engaged shareholders exercising the job of accountability which needs to be imposed on the managers making these balancing decisions. But I think that's the set of issues about which we need to have a proper debate. And to go back to Bob Eccles' question uh, two or three minutes ago, um, I think in terms of where we take the legal structure in this country and in other countries, I think the British formulation is in fact not bad as it is at the moment. But it's only if we have the kind of debate about these issues and about the nature of accountability which there is that I think we can get a clarification and probably what is required is a legal clarification about what the, the legal position of a corporation in modern society is. Uh, fascinating as always, Professor Kay. Um, just really one question. I mean, where do you see sort of companies exhibiting this, this, this approach? I mean, I've been very impressed working with Yorkshire Water, a regional utility, which have been trying to express that using the, the approach of the integrated reporting framework. So they, they think about these, these things. But any, any suggestions you have of companies who are living this approach? I think one of the things I've learned is that this kind of approach is what a very high proportion of managers in companies and asset managers who are responsibility for investment would like to do. And they feel under pressures, uh, under pressure on the one hand from these erroneous rhetorical statements about what the duties of companies in a modern economy are, and in the asset management community in large part because they feel under pressures to generate alpha and three year, if three not, not three month periods uh, in order to take a short term relative performance view of how they, they handle their assets. I think what we need to do in this sense is change the rhetoric to make it more aligned with what I believe a large majority of people in both the investment community and the corporate sector would really like to be doing. 